This Veterans Day, there is hopeful news about spinal cord injury research. A Swiss research team describes a paralyzed monkey walking again with help from an implant connecting its brain to a device that applies electrical pulses to its spine. One researcher says it could be 10 years or less before we could offer human patients something similar as therapy. Meanwhile, other researchers have been working on similar brain control technology for upper body rehabilitation and also electrical stimulation systems without brain computer interfaces, all for helping paralyzed people use their legs, and regain other functions. A couple of those researchers join me now. Susan Harkeman is a professor of neurological surgery at the University of Louisville in Louisville, Kentucky. Welcome to Science Friday. It's great to be back. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And Balu Ajibogi is assistant professor of biomedical engineering at Case Western Reserve University. He joins us from uh, Cleveland. Welcome to Science Friday, Dr. Ajibogi. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, Let's talk about this new research first. Uh, Susan Harkeman, can you, de- can you describe for us uh, how the monkeys could walk again, what this brain-computer interface was? Well, yeah, so it's been known for a long time that mammals with um, support to their spinal cord with stimulation or applying drugs can regain locomotion when their spinal cord is transected. In this case, they just took one pathway away, the cortical spinal pathway, that's thought to be important for movement. But what's uh, new about this is they recorded signals from the brain and they used wireless technology to send those signals after they had uh, cut the spinal cord and then tell the other piece of technology to send signals to help the paralyzed part of the body reactivate uh, to step. So what they did is took some knowledge that was already known and put it together in a unique way. Mm. Dr. Ajibaya, what uh, excites you about this? Well, I think the research itself is quite novel, quite interesting. Um, as Dr. Harkman mentioned, they're using a brain-computer face to uh, create stimulation or to control stimulation. Um, it does suggest that in a person with a thoracic level spinal cord injury, you may be able to do something similar. A lot of the technology that they used is already approved for human use. Um, there are some caveats to the research, I believe, you know, the necessity of a brain computer interface for restoring locomotion. But overall, I think scientifically, it's very interesting. Now, I know that your work looks at uh, brain interface technology, but for rehabilitating upper limbs, um, where, where does that research currently stand? Yes, so I work in a collaboration a, a, a collaboration with uh, a number of universities around the country in a clinical trial called BrainGate. And the goal of the BrainGate clinical trial is to use brain-computer interface, brain-computer interface technology uh, and connect it with functional electrical stimulation technology to restore hand and arm movements to persons with spinal, high, high-level spinal cord injury. Uh, we currently have one participant enrolled in Cleveland, and we are at this point working on connecting those two systems. Um, functional electrical stimulation um, has been around for decades. It was pioneered at Case Western by Dr. Hunter Peckham and uh, Dr. Robert Kirsch. Um, it actually became a commercial product in the mid 90s. Um, there was a product available to persons with cervical level 5 spinal cord injury to restore hand grasping. Uh, we are now c- trying to connect that technology, um, that implantable technology, to an, to an implanted brain-computer interface to restore both reaching and grasping uh, to somebody with high cervical spinal cord injury. Mm. Dr. Harkheimer, what, what's the difference between that and uh, what you are working on? Well, uh, what we have been focusing on is related to the stimulation in the current paper of the human spinal cord. So. We're using current technology to activate the spinal cord networks for walking, for standing, and for voluntary movement in very very severely paralyzed um, humans. And uh, what's very exciting is that um, bringing the scientists and the technology together is uh, enabling us to make uh, pretty significant advances in all those areas. In addition, why, while we've been studying walking and standing and moving voluntarily, we found that other conditions such as cardiovascular deficits, respiratory, poor blood flow, 
um, lots of other secondary conditions, bowel and bladder, seem to be positively affected by the stimulation. So this is a time where we're starting to understand the complexity of the nervous system being able to exploit that. And if we work hand in hand with developing the technology, I think that we can see some great advances in uh, recovery after paralysis for people with spinal cord injury. Mm -hmm. So we started out with locomotion. We're still working on that. We um, have uh, uh, been working on that for several years now, but are also branching out to many other areas that affect people with paralysis mm. uh, today. Do you find, I'll, I'll ask this to both of you, do you, do you find that uh, these newer technologies, uh, the, the fact that you can uh, stimulate the nerve endings below the, the spinal cord injury, that it does might help make connections better and have them regrow back partially themselves? Well, I think that there's not uh, evidence that, that it's going to enable them to regrow, uh, but I think that there's so much plasticity in the nervous system that it is able to take advantage of the system that still exists. And I think that was really not well understood until now. But what's important is with regeneration techniques, techniques that are also advancing, coupling these two could be extraordinary because you wouldn't need to have a regeneration technique that would completely regenerate the nervous system. Maybe it would only need to regenerate a small percentage of fibers and you couple it with this technology and get a pretty tremendous recovery. Mm -hmm. So I think multiple strategies together will ultimately be the answer. Mm -hmm. yeah, and maybe I'll add to that that I think that we as scientists just need to be a bit careful about some of the claims that we make. Um, so we're obviously this paper and the work that we're talking about is not claiming that we are fully regenerating the spinal cord. Our particular approach is to essentially circumvent the spinal cord um, to basically be able to take those uh, cortical signals that are that are generated in the brain, circumvent the spinal cord, and create the necessary stimulation patterns to create the same movements that would occur if the spinal cord were intact. So. And how soon? I mentioned that there were some scientists who were saying we might see new research applied to uh, patients within 10 years. Do you both do you both think that's possible? Well, I think, you know, there's, there's many unknowns. Uh, to translate something to the human, um, you, you know, there's a lot of um, stakeholders who have to work together. There's a lot of unknowns. Uh, and so I think I would be really cautious in trying yeah. to put a timeline on it. But what I think is exciting about it is that this, there's, there's been many scientific breakthroughs. So the path is known on how to get there. So bringing um, uh, the technology uh, that, that is known out there together with the scientists, I think could really accelerate that. Mm -hmm. uh, two, two years ago, we talked to you after your team used electrical pulses in the spine to help two men move their legs voluntarily after years of paralysis. Um, mm -hmm. how, what, 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 what's happened since then? Uh, have we seen advances since then? Have you had other successes? We have. We've uh, now implanted 10 individuals, um, and we have um, uh, seen very similar results uh, in varying degrees. Uh, both in the ability to uh, move voluntarily and stand. So that is very positive in uh, that we can reproduce those results. Um, we still need, as I have mentioned several times, we need to couple that with the technology to make it useful in the home and community. So that's one of the areas of research we're working very hard on. And um, we also have uh, uh, a grant where we're looking at the cardiovascular function and we're working towards um, actually doing a very large cohort of 36 patients where we um, will be looking at uh, the secondary conditions, cardiovascular function. And we're hoping that that's something that might be uh, translated uh, pretty quickly because we can, we've seen results with that with the existing technology. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, I mean, I think this is a, a, a very promising area. Uh, that many scientific groups are working on. It is very positive, um, and uh, uh, we're, we're very excited uh, where the path yeah. is going. Yeah. Um, Dr. Ajiboyi, uh, we, we heard about this being a breakthrough, this, this trial with the monkeys. Uh, 
because it, is, it uses wireless technology, which has to carry a lot of data for this to work, right? When you look at the future of the brain-computer interfaces, what, what do we still need to improve on, on here? Well, so first and foremost, I think the wireless technology is a breakthrough, and it is necessary for clinical translation. Um, in our current clinical trial, participants um, have a percutaneous uh, pedestal or a pedestal which uh, goes through the skull, and they are connected to our recording devices. Uh, for them to be able to use these systems on a regular basis, we need a system which allows us to perform 24-7 recording, um, and that's wireless. So that, that's definitely a breakthrough. Um, there needs to be a number of techn technological advances in terms of the interface. Um, we need to make sure that the interfaces are robust, that they're able to outlive the patients, they're able to record high fidelity and robust neural signals for long periods of time so that, you know, just like they did in the paper, we can extract, we can have confidence in the information that we extract from the neural signals related to movement. Mm -hmm. We also need the ability to uh, record from large numbers of, of neurons. Um, most of the current work, you know, my work included, the work in the paper, are fairly limited in terms of the number of neurons you're able to record from simultaneously. We need to be able to record, I believe, from thousands, hundreds, you know, tens, tens of thousands of neurons simultaneously um, so that we can begin to think about controlling um, high-dimensional systems. So in, in the case of reaching and grasping, to be able to control the shoulder, the elbow, right. the hand, right. the wrist, all the fingers together, we need high-dimensional uh, systems, uh, high-dimensional recordings that allow us to control these high-dimensional systems. Dr. Bilou Ajiboyi, uh, Assistant Professor of Biomedical Engineering at Case Western Reserve. Dr. Susan Harkema, Professor of Neurological Surgery at the University of Louisville. Thank you both for taking time to be with us today. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank you very much.